Welcome to the Leadership Talks. It's a podcast. In today's episode, we're joined by the talented LPGA player Allison Lee. Allison isn't just a phenomenal golfer, she's also a savvy entrepreneur, mastering the art of building her own brand. Today, we'll delve into how the skills and strategies she's honed on the golf course translate into successful business leadership. Join us as Allison shares her journey, insights, and tips on navigating the competitive world of professional sports and entrepreneurship. Stay tuned for an inspiring conversation that blends sportsmanship with business acumen. And before we get started, I think, Allison, I think it was in 2022, you wrote an article. It was titled, Two Sides of an Unforgiving Game. Was it in 2022? Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. It was okay. somewhere around there, yeah. And it was for the LPGA website. It detailed uh, your bouts with crippling anxiety as you were trying to maintain your footing on the LPGA tour. And now in the news, you find Allison Lee smashes 36 hole scoring record on LET after consecutive 61 scores. That was, I believe, the tournament you won on LET. Mm -hmm. Just couple months ago mm -hmm. or so. So uh, congratulations. Thank on you. That. Mm -hmm. um, so let's dive into it. Transforming passion into a brand. Allison, how have your, you navigated the journey from being a professional athlete to creating the Allison Lee brand and what leadership qualities have been key to this transformation? Um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, because most of the time I feel like most of us who play sports or play on the professional level, um, we don't really think about that stuff. We don't really think about our brand or who we represent. We just want to be the best at what we do. And that's kind of how I went through life for a really long time. Ever since I was a little girl, I started playing golf when I was around five um, and then ultimately turned pro when I was 19. So, I mean, that was just the goal at the end of the day, right? To become a professional golfer. Um, but since turning pro, I mean, I just finished my ninth year on tour. Um, there's a lot of other things you need to think about other than just, you know, being the best out there. It's, you know, handling yourself well on the course, um, making sure you're a good role model to a lot of the future generations who could be, you know, joining the game and, um, and just trying to set a good example. And for me, a lot of that had to do with making sure, you know, I just carried myself well on the course. I showed a lot of grace. Um, a lot of that as well was, you know, maintaining, um, being in school. Uh, I turned pro in the middle of my sophomore year at UCLA, but I wanted to continue my education. And so I stayed in school and got my degree in 2017. Um, and I did that mostly because I feel like a lot of girls um, this day and age who play professional golf, a lot of them forego going to college. Um, and I think, you know, I think it was such a great experience for me. And I feel like I learned so much. And I I know sometimes timing is everything, especially if your game is in the right place. Um, for me, that was when I was 19. And I don't regret a single moment of of turning pro when I did. But I mean, I feel like for a lot of girls, even going to school for one year, two years, I feel like can really, really be some of the best times of your life. And you learn so much. And I know for me, when I turned pro or when I decided to go to school, when I did, um, not that I got backlash, but I got a lot of um, people saying or questioning why I was and why I wasn't turning pro sooner. Uh, cause like I said, timing is very important. And at the time, right before school, I was one of the top junior golfers in the world at the time. So a lot of people questioned why I didn't just turn pro immediately, but I'm so glad I went to school. And that's something I wish a lot of other girls would do. Cause I mean, those are years you can never go and, and take back and those years are priceless. Um, so yeah. And going back to school when you're like 30 or 40 is a different experience. Yeah, it's tough. It's very different. <laughs> I mean, it, it's. I feel like playing the game of golf, we grow up 
very quickly, especially turning pro at a young age. I mean, we're traveling the world. I was traveling the world at 20 years old. Um, you know, I had to, I purchased a home. I had to learn how to do my taxes. <laughs> I had to write some, sorry, I'll just silence this. I really forgot to. I had to write paychecks. I had to hire people. I had to hire a caddy. I had to go through the process of hiring an agent. I mean, stuff like that. A lot of, I feel like most 20 year olds don't do, yeah. um, but college just kind of like the stepping stone, like living alone for a little bit, making some friends, navigating life, you know, alone and with other people around the same age. And I feel like it's just not the same when you go back to school at a, at a later age. Cause then if you go to later age, it's just more for furthering education versus I feel like when you go to college right out of high school, I mean, it's time. Those are the times and the years to make mistakes, learn about what you want to do. Um, and and figure out what your purpose is in life. Yeah, and I uh, I think you found your purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely helping out a lot of uh, a lot of people, especially girls. So um, this kind of leads what you said leads to the next question: strategic decision making, like you had to make a decision on and off the course. Can you share how the strategic decision making skills you've honed in the golf have translated into running your business and your personal brand? Because you are, like you said, you have people that work for you, you write checks, you have to maintain and yeah, expenses, travel, mm -hmm. stay, which we talked about why sponsors come in handy, so. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to decision-making or planning, I mean, I, I feel like for what I do, a lot of that has to do with how I perform. So, you know, I, we play in a tournament or a few tournaments and you just kind of look back at your, the statistics and how you played and it's like, and how you performed and you just kind of go from there and you decide what do I need to get better at? What are my weaknesses? Um, what can I improve on? Uh, and also at the same time, it's, it's, you know, asking people around you as well. It's, it's not just trying to figure and navigate everything alone. Um, and I feel like having a coach, um, having a good mentor, having good people around you who can help guide you as well. I mean, for the longest time, I know for me, when I was young, I feel like I figured out everything and I didn't need <laughs> other people to, you know, tell me what to do or what I need to get better at. I thought it was pretty clear, like, oh, well, I know what I need to do better. Like, I, I know already what will make me get better and I know what works for me. Um, but there are times it's nice to get just like a few extra set of eyes to and unbiased opinions. Um, and sometimes you need, you know, the cold hard truth and like what you need to get better at. And for me this year, my swing coach, Chris Mason, um, he really told me like, Hey, you need to get better at putting. Like your putting sets are great. What about, you know, seeing a putting coach? And I was like, no, I don't need one. I have you already. <laughs> like, I know I'm really good at putting. I just need to figure stuff out on my own. And I was pretty stubborn in, in that regard. And, after a few more months, I thought, okay, hey, like, it couldn't hurt because I mean, I'm I'm 28, and for my whole life, I never had a putting coach because it always came to me naturally. But this year, I struggled a lot with putting on the mental side, and so I started seeing a putting coach here in Vegas. His name is Chris Cho, um, and th that really turned things around. And I think that was kind of the extra, the extra ingredient I needed. I think to see that success at the end of the year and that really helped a lot and so yeah i mean it's it's just simple things like that um it's it's obviously difficult if comparing it to a business sense because a lot of golf is very it's very like results based i mean it's very clear what you need to work on like okay clearly didn't have a great score today. I made a lot of dumb mistakes. It's very obvious and easy to see what you need to get better at, at and work on. Um, but extra help people can help you like try a different drill, trying a new practice drill, um, trying a new method with your swing or a different way of thinking when putting. Like, like there's so many different ways you can 
try and tweak and improve on your game. And even if it's talking to other professional golfers as well, I mean, there's no shame in doing that. I know a lot of people, I think, don't want to show those weaknesses to their fellow competitors because that's who they're competing against at the end of the day. But I mean, if you have some good friends out there just asking and putting that um, ego aside and really getting a fresh set of eyes to help you, because, I mean, that, that can go one way. Yeah, no, I agree. And actually, I um, I compare golf a lot to life and business. Um, there's so much in common. I mean, it, it is ultimately a mental game. I mean, mm -hmm. and you wrote, like, you were dealing with that issue of, Am I going to lose my LPGA? Am I going to hang in here? Should I stay here? You've got to make a choice. And as entrepreneurs, we do that all the time too. Mm -hmm. It's not all green grass and sunshine every day. Mm -hmm. We go through struggles too. Um, I just think in golf, it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love golf, but man, sometimes you, you, know, you have one great hole and then you fall apart. And for you guys, you guys have four days in a row. You got to perform mm -hmm. because it's so easy to lose that lead or, you know, one, one bad putt. Um, so I think the comparison is actually very uh, real life. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, you see it in golfers every day. Like, I mean, one professional golfer can miss 10 cuts in a row and then have one really, really good week. And that can really turn their career around. And I feel like the same goes for any startup or any businesses. Like they can not be doing great. And it seems like they're kind of headed for disaster. And then one really good business decision or a really good investment can change the company around and turn it into something amazing. I feel like a good example is uh, GoDaddy. I, I don't know if you've heard the story, but I know back in the day they were Bob Parsons now, he has yeah. PXG. PXG, I mean, yeah. He, the company almost went bankrupt and he made one smart, you know, business decision and putting basically the last penny into one commercial to run during the Super Bowl. And ever since then, like GoDaddy just soared and did super amazing. So sometimes it's, you know, taking those risks and, and one good smart decision from a business sense and one good week on the golf course, I mean, can really change the course and direction of, of the, of the future. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think one thing that you said earlier was surrounding yourself with the right people, um, which is what Bordsai helps companies. Mm -hmm. And that's everybody from startup to large companies, because large companies struggle too, or um, mid-range companies that are looking for growth. And sometimes they're just missing that outside perspective. So I was bringing those executives into a board or an advisor role is what really gives them that hope and you like you said you can see that you know bringing in a different putting coach and giving you a different perspective because not same putting drills might not work for every single golfer so mm -hmm. i think it's like that in life in general mm -hmm. um oh great reading it leading into the role of continuous learning with the ever-evolving nature of both professional sports and business how do you approach continuous learning and staying ahead of the curve? We already touched a little bit on it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the same thing, right? It's it's really leaning on friends and family and your team around you. Um, it's hard. I feel like I know specifically for golf, it's with every year passing by, there's always new fresh faces on the scene, new golfers that are really up and coming and and really freaking good and every year that goes by the game just gets harder and harder and if you aren't on top of it those people will start to dwindle away so it's just keeping up with you know hard work and determination and yeah it's it's tough to stay ahead of the curve but i mean it's just all comes down to working hard and practicing hard working with your coach um finding new ways to get better, really honing into what your weaknesses are. Um, now in golf, this day and age, it's, there's a lot you can learn about your game when it comes to strokes gained, statistics. Uh, now we all have a track man. We can see numbers on why we aren't hitting it further. We can, you know, try different clubs, different shafts to see what best, best fits us to hit the ball further. Um, there's so much data out there now to help, your game and like take it to the next level. 
So it's just always like working. I mean, it's, it's constantly improving and going out there practicing and grinding and even like, I mean, and keeping it fun too. It, it's, I think that's an important part, playing some money games with friends once in a while. <laughs> and it, it really does. Um, and just keeping it fun. It's, it's not only work all the time, but making sure you still enjoy it and you're working towards a specific goal. And yeah, just trying your best to, I mean, because if you don't enjoy it anymore, there's not going to be any fun and practicing. You're not going to get, you're not going to feel rewarded for all the hard work you do. So it's, it's, it's a cycle. It's, it's trying to have fun at what you do. Cause if you don't, you're not going to work hard and you're going to eventually do a dull out. So it's making sure you still enjoy every single day, showing up to the golf course, showing up to tournaments, um, and making the most of it. Making the cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you definitely seemed like you enjoyed yourself last, was it four tournaments in a row? Yeah, it's definitely fun. I mean, if, if, <laughs> If business is good, if golf is good, if everything's going well and you're in contention, you know, it's it's always fun. And cause cause those are the moments where you see your hard work pay off. Yeah. Um, there are obviously moments where, you know, like you said, missing a cut, not performing well, it can really take a toll on you. And there have definitely been moments in my career where it would just suck. Like it was so miserable because it could really affect your life outside the course. I mean, no matter how much you try and compartmentalize your time at tournaments or on the course and like your time at home with friends and family, it's, it's really tough to separate that. Um, but I feel like with time you can get better at it, but still, I still try and work on it. I mean, there are definitely moments where if I have a really rough day on the course or don't perform the way I did or made some stupid mistakes, I definitely bring that home with me. Yeah. It's definitely something I'm always going to have to work on. Um, but just trying hard to separate that, right? I mean, obviously, if I have a really great day, it's going to make me feel <laughs> really freaking awesome, um, which I think that's fine. But it's the moments where it gets tough. It's like, okay, what can I do to bounce back? What can I do at home to make sure I kind of just brush off what happened and then wake up the next day and like try and improve and then try and keep myself in a positive mindset? Because it's very easy to just spiral and into a negative place and almost doubt yourself, you know, with, with what you're capable of. But I mean, moments where you play really great, obviously it brings you back to, Oh, this is why, like, these are the moments, these, this is fun. Yeah. Like, this is why I worked really hard. This is because I want to be right here. Absolutely. And, uh, winning is a good feeling. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what you work so hard for. Um, so team dynamics in individual sports. So obviously golf is often uh, seen as an individual sport, but yet team dynamics play a role. How do you balance personal performance with team interactions, especially in events like uh, Solheim Cup? I believe that's a team event. But even thinking of that in teams, I mean, you have uh, a caddy and that is your priceless team member you're relying obviously on him and how he's walked the course and calculated everything so he can guide you along the way and you know you have a choice to either agree or or disagree with his recommendation so there's a trust factor there so um how do you feel about team dynamics yeah i mean golf is obviously an interesting game it's a very individual sport um you know i mean some of my closest friends are right there on tour with me and as much as I want them to win, like I want to win more than they do. <laughs> it it does make for a really interesting dynamic in, in friendship. Um, but yeah, you still have a team. You have your friends and your family. You have your coach, you know, that's they're cheering you on, helping you become better at what you do. I mean, if I, I feel like everyone needs a coach, whether it's a mental coach, swing coach, putty coach, anything. I feel like you can only benefit from that. Um, and you really trust them. They give you confidence. They make you better. Same with a caddy. I mean, having a caddy, going through a caddy hiring process is obviously always tough. Um, you just need to find the right person for you. Um, and sometimes that might take a few trials uh, to find the right person for you. Even after years of being with the same caddy, they can, it can get to a point where the relationship comes to an end as well. Um, but yeah, how I always see it is, 
when it comes to my caddy, it's like the right caddy. If you have the right caddy, you know, before even teeing it up that they will save you strokes on the course. And just with that kind of mindset in mind, it gives you a little bit of confidence going into the round, like knowing they did their work, knowing they'll help you make the right decisions. Um, and even on top of that, just even without the the numbers or anything go specific, like knowing they'll have your back and knowing they'll keep you calm, keep you confident on the course and keep you in the right headspace and mindset um, throughout the entire round, whether you're last place or in contention to win. So yeah, I feel like when it comes to golf, you're, your caddy is is your most important club in the bag, essentially. So, um, yeah, I mean, having having a good caddy is really important. Having a good team around you, despite it being an individual sport, um, it's really essential to to succeeding on life on tour. I agree, and I think uh, your caddy last few events did a great yeah, job. Yeah, he did great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, vision for the future, looking forward. Uh, season's over now what are your goals for both your golfing career and your entrepreneurial ventures how do these reflect your personal values and leadership style um so for me personally i when i was when i first came on tour i did set a lot of goals for myself and uh there were a lot of goals that i wasn't able to achieve um so that became tough for me, you know, making setting goals. And so now I've been trying to, instead of setting goals, more like setting a list of achievements I want on a smaller scale, instead of my goals being, okay, I want to win. I want to be the number one player in the world. I want to get topped in every event. I try and narrow it down to like little smaller achievements that seem more attainable. Because sometimes when you set a big goal for yourself, it's like, okay, I want to achieve that. But like, there's nothing in between. So for me, it's, I think more on the basic level, like, okay, I want to hit it a couple yards further this next season. So what am I going to do to that? Okay. I'm going to work out harder in the gym. I'm going to hit more range balls, increase my swing speed. Um, I want to lower my putting average every round to below 29, 29 mm -hmm. or less. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, so instead of thinking about the end result of like winning, I try, I've been trying to think more from a statistical standpoint that feels like it's more attainable. So it's all the little small things. Because if I were to be able to achieve all the little things that I mentioned, like I said, hitting a little further, you know, increasing my driving accuracy, lowering my putting average, hitting more greens and regulation, small stuff like that at the end of the day, my big goals will come come to fruition so it's just focusing on the little things because i know i can control those things it's like okay as soon as the tournament's over i can look through my stats and go okay i achieved this this and this i didn't achieve this so this is what i need to work on moving forward to the next week so it's doing small things like that um from a golf perspective from an entrepreneurial expect perspective i started angel investing in a couple companies last year so awesome. that's been a, a fun little side thing for me that i've been doing especially now since i'm 28 I'm, I'm going into my 10th year on tour and, and starting to think about you know the next 20 30 years from now yeah. um because usually as a golfer i feel like you usually think about the next tournament like wanting to do well the next event but i've been trying to think like beyond that now now that i've been on tour for a long time and i've been able to establish myself as a top player on tour so it's thinking about that next step like i said 20 30 years down the line um because that's been a really cool and fun side project no uh, modeling career in the future no <laughs> just grayson <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um earlier i had i was playing uh, bmw where you were on the final day on sunday you started off on number one spot and ended up uh dropping down to second third i think for a second came back up i mean you almost made some really long pats for eagles but you ended up burning those holes mm -hmm. It came out and I believe you tied at the end of 18. So you had to go into playoffs mm -hmm. and you came in second. Um, that's it. I know that's tough, mm -hmm. but I want you to know I'm super proud yeah, of you. Thank I mean, you. It's <laughs> so awesome to see that. Um, and I know in the back of your head, I mean, just like in business, what could I have done better? Um, and I was actually just thinking this myself because for the first time ever, I play at 
Uh, we play an MGA tournament every Saturday at my country mm-hmm. club. And first time ever, this last Saturday, um, I came in second mm-hmm. with my partner. Mm-hmm. Um, he did really good. I did good on the holes. He didn't do good on, so it all worked out great. Mm-hmm. But literally one stroke behind the first place. And I was like, mm-hmm. I can repeat the holes where I'm like, I know I should have made that putt. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it was just right there. So that's a, that's a tough one. But I think you're right, setting shorter goals. And I think you had a one for 2023. You're ranked 21 in the world now. Um, what were you ranked last year? You remember? 50? I think it was 50 around, 50. around 50. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that's a big improvement. Um, so I'm personally looking forward to 2024. Um, it'll be exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anything else you want to leave us with wisdom, words, of um, future? I don't know. I mean, I guess just whatever other questions you have, but, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to next year. Um, I feel like I ended this year on a really good note. Um, you know, hopefully I can do more of that next year. Um, I feel like it definitely lit a fire inside me this year, like being in contention and being so close at the end of the year yeah. quite a bit. Um, cause that just adds to all the experience I have, all the confidence I have. Cause I mean, I was so nervous. Like that, <laughs> that last day in Korea, I was so, so, so nervous. And as the next weeks followed, I was in that same place again. I was in contention again for the last two weeks yeah. of the year. And I, I I had a bit more of a sense of calm. Um, I think it's because I, you know, was right in it. And it was, as opposed to being nervous, it was a form of excitement. And it was just so fun. Obviously, I was disappointed at the, at the end of the day. But it, it's just so fun to be in contention. And I really missed it. I mean, I before turning pro, I was one of the top players in the, in the country for my age and same with college. And then my rookie year on tour was, I was a contention a lot. Um, But yeah, I I just, I want to win super badly. I've been able to win on the LET. I haven't won on the LPGA yet. So that's something I'm still, um, still going towards. It's a goal, I guess, but I'm, I'm trying to think of the small steps I need to take to get there. And I know what those are now. Um, so it's just, I guess, keeping my head in the game and knowing exactly what I need to do, keeping my head down and not getting too ahead of myself and not jumping over to what could happen in the future. Just kind of focusing on what I can do now and what I can control now. Well, I think ending the season like you ended, it's a great start to 2024. Great energy, good vibe. And... uh you're going to have those opportunities again. So I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. Um, obviously, I you know watch on Instagram your travels and eating great food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're lucky being in Vegas because we do have great food here. Yes, the best food. Um, but it's always fun to travel. But best pizza in Las Vegas. Martha. <laughs> <Mark, laughs> <Thomas>. Yes. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Had to make you say that. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to Leadership Talks. Don't forget to subscribe for more insightful conversations with industry leaders. Your support means a lot to us.